Customer should be your first thought in the morning. Yeah? But it's difficult to grasp the customer in its entirety, right? Like, who is the customer? What is the customer? Is it like this random stock photo we <laughs> glue to our <laughs> office walls and say, this is Jim, he has two children and wants to buy a house? That doesn't work. You need to tell in context like how you how this person creates business value. And at Netflix, they made people read the profit and loss statements. Everyone has to understand how business value is created. But that's a tough approach. So research suggests how we best understand um, difficult content is with stories, right? So at Signavio, um, we developed a new notation the customer journey mapping. Um, oh, I missed that one. So this is how we did it in the past. Like we have this undifferentiated swim lane over there, the customer, where we throw something into and something comes back. But we develop a new notation where you can finally have like an outside in view into your operations, into your business. But um, obviously we're not, we do not want to build the next PowerPoint, the powerful part comes when you connect that to the operational reality, right? So we combine that with our process intelligence um, capabilities, and then the information we generate, we pull that back into our journeys, right? But then we are able to tell that stuff in a, con uh, in a context. I heard recently the quote, if content is king, context is God. Right? So for some people, a traffic light is enough. Uh, so um, obviously, process intelligence and process design still needs to go hand in hand. But we put the outside in perspective to the mix. Right? Connect your customer journey to your operations and do it in a way that everyone understands what's happening, right? An easy language. And that's a very complex thing to do, actually. You have N amount of journeys, you have M personas, you have X processes, and Z interaction points. So we are working, like with our collaboration hub, to have an easy hub where uh, people can share their opinions, comment, collaborate, so you get every different opinion into the mix and can improve your processes and the customer experience. So talking about context, uh, you saw that before with the traffic light, like we drown in analysis, we drown in data. Like we want to have like a customer journey used as a dashboard for the stuff you need, right? And for example, here you can optimize, talking about business transformations, you can optimize how quick a taxi gets to the customer. But the journey actually that Uber discovered is how to go from A to B. Or Zappos, right? E-commerce company in the United States, the longest customer service call was 13 hours. BPM always does uh, be quicker, do more, optimize, but sometimes that destroys the journey. And this is something that we add to the mix. So it's easier to understand now what the customer experience is and of course fulfillment. In the end, operational excellence stays a requirement, right? So this is why you have to be data-driven, act data-inspired. So to wrap this up, you're not in the business of selling alone. You're in the business of Jim wants to buy a house. That's the journey. That's the thinking you need. So the customer is king. Huh? And luckily, I'm not alone today. The product owner of our process intelligence suite is here, Enrico. And at Signavio, we have our capabilities, like with our collaboration hub in the middle, where everyone can consume content. And Enrico is going to show you how we model processes and journeys and leverage process intelligence for that. Thank you. Let's move this up here. Let's see. All right, good to go. 
Well, so you've already stolen my introduction, but yeah, what I'm, um, hello everybody, what I'm trying to show <laughs> is of course um, how all these different things join up, right? How do we get uh, customer journey maps, CJMs, BPMM models, and as well then process analysis to work together? And I want to show an example end-to-end um, -end of how we can use all these, these things to drive process improvement. Right. So uh, what we have here right now is the, is the editor, Signavio editor, and we have the customer journey map, CJM, notation open. You can see here that I can, um, I can edit it as I want, move things about, right? This here is uh, Jennifer, our persona, our customer, and she has a goal, which is simply to uh, keep connected to the internet. The example that we're working with is we're a broadband company, and um, our customers often have uh, issues with connectivity, right? So in this example, the customer journey map simply shows what happens when um, an issue is reported. Yeah. Customers waiting for the resolution, we're trying to identify the issue and then finally resolve it. But it's not just about the modeling part. We also want people to get involved into, um, into, into these journeys, into these models, to really try and understand them and share with the rest of the organization. So for that, we have our collaboration hub, which is what you're seeing here. And here, the interaction with the model is actually completely different, right? So rather than being able to edit it to move things about, what we get is more information about the different things that are happening. So if we click on one of these touch points here, for example, we get the KPIs and a description, as well as uh, processes that are linked to this particular step in the journey map, right? But we don't want it to be just about sharing um, we also want to have data connected to this, of course, right? The big problem being, we think we know what's happening in terms of our customer journeys, but maybe uh, the data tells a really different story. So for that, we've extended our notation a little bit, and we have introduced these health indicators, which are attached to these various steps. Of course, in the customer journey map, we're not always part of the journey, especially at the beginning, where the customer, in this case, discovers the broadband outage, and then thinks, do I call the, uh, the support? Do I do something else? And then finally, when uh, she picks up the phone, that's where we see her and get involved for the first time. And as we can see here by this high-level indicator, actually, it seems based on our data and um, that we've mined from our various source systems along the journey here, um, that everything looks OK at the reporting step. But then as we look at um, identifying issues and then resolving them, we're having some problems with our, with our KPIs. So if we click on one of these here, we can see our process metrics for this particular step. We can see that um, we have three defined here. There's the time to resolution of the issue, of course, cost per incident, and then as well caseload. We can actually see that cost per incident is uh, not performing as well as we'd like it to, as well as time to resolution, the cycle time being much higher than it should be. We can have a look and see what investigations have been uh, done into these issues in the past. We can see, okay, We've looked at caseload in the past. That looks like it was resolved, and certainly the, the, uh, the data is reflecting that. Um, we could start a new investigation to look at these two problem KPIs that we have right now. But there's one actually open already, so maybe we'll have a look at that. Okay. Now we are switching perspective from the, um, the process owner or the process excellence team that might be consuming um, these uh, journeys that we were looking at earlier to the analyst who really then has to find the problem and uh, talk about it, report it, make it uh, documentable in a way that people can understand. Right? So for that, we have our, our notebook approach, which is what you're seeing here. And uh, let's start here on the left-hand side. First things first, we of course have to select the data set that we're looking at. Uh, in this case, we have the issue to resolution data set, uh, which already has a couple of investigations started, including this one here. We can see that the analyst is uh, actually documented as his first step in this, um, in this outline that he's looking at cases from January 2018, which is about 8,800 cases. Okay. And he's looking at time to resolution and, of course, uh, the cost of issue resolving as well. As we go further down, we can then um, really make sure that this document contains everything that we need to, uh, to make a decision at the end. Do we uh, affect an improvement? Um, is it worthwhile or not? So for that, of course, we link back to the customer journey map. And we have a quick overview of the key KPIs, like cycle time. We can see that actually, um, overall, for the whole data set, for all 8,800 cases, it looks like cycle time is between six and eight days, much higher than we'd expect. We can see that most cases are related to connection loss, and San Francisco, New York, seem to have the most outages. Going down, then, we can also link a BPMM diagram, which is what we've done here. I guess this will be the, the other perspective. 
Um, we can also describe it, make sure that people understand what they're looking at. This is how we'd expect it to work. And maybe something interesting to mention at this point is that, of course, this process doesn't just involve one system, but actually in, in this particular example, there's three involved. So when the customer first calls, first reports the issue, that's, of course, the CRM system. Then we have the ticketing system that uh, tracks the progress. And finally, we have a scheduling system that comes into action if the case is escalated to third level support. And what we do is we make sure that we connect to all of these systems, that we mine the events from these systems um, and bring them all together for analysis right here. Another thing that's worth mentioning is that the analyst has uh, mapped, created a mapping here from the events to the individual activities you can see here. And that will become relevant in a second. I just want to make sure I mention it at this stage. So we have one or more events that, um, that correspond to, to this step and this step and so on and so forth. And if we go further down here, we can actually use that information, this mapping, to see what's happening, not from an event perspective, but from an activity perspective. So here we can see that from these 8,800 cases from January, just one month, it actually looks like we're performing a lot of network tests, over 10,000, which is more than, than actually issues reported. And we can also see that um, we are sending out field engineers over 6,000 times, almost uh, two-thirds of, uh, of all cases, which might explain our problem. And of course, the analyst has documented that here. For other people, um, the excellence team maybe then reveal this information so they can also understand it. What we're doing next is we're having a look at um, process discovery. Here we can look at the, um, the raw data that we've mined from these systems without any activity mappings, just looking at the most common variants, uh, which are these three here that we've selected. And what we can see is that indeed we seem to have some rework um, performing network tests. So that seems to happen more than once quite a lot of the time. But it's actually not what's causing our, our cycle time issue. As we swap over to, to the cycle time view here, it looks that where we're losing most of time is actually from field visit conducted to then resolving the issue. Using our mapping again, we can look at that um, as an overlay on the, on the BPMN diagram, which looks like this. And here we can select the variant that we just saw, and we can, um, we can ask the tool to show us what does that look like. And we can see, okay, it looks like there is some rework, but actually that's uh, not significant. But then when we escalate it to third level support, and then send out an engineer, we seem to have a cycle time uh, just for these steps of uh, four days, right? Which might explain the, the problems. What's happened next then is we have some, some additional chapters in our document. Being a document, it does have chapters, um, but it doesn't just serve for, for dividing the, the information. We can actually apply filters here as well. So we have one chapter here, which is uh, only looking at cases where field visits occurred. We can use our filters here to make sure um, that we're only focusing on those activities. And of course, only where we've had connection loss. Again, we have a summary explaining the issue. Um, and we can see actually that for this subset of data, the cycle time is pretty high. Field visits uh, seem to be the cause of the problem. We can overlay that again on the, on the process model. We can see, yeah, that is indeed the, the problematic variant. We can have a look at the individual cases that make up this uh, subset of data. We have the case IDs here, so we can look them up in our different systems, try and reason about, about what's happened on a case-by-case -case basis. And then we can compare that to uh, the second chapter that follows. I guess I should have the outline on the left. There we go. Um, which is then, again, uh, all the cases that uh, don't have field visits. right? And again, we can use our filters to, to only search for those. We can see the cycle time is much, much lower. And again, the process model overlay shows, yeah, the third level support escalation is not there. Finally, then, the questions that we are uh, going to ask ourselves is, OK, it looks like we have an issue. What are we going to do about it? Um, and is it worthwhile um, improving the process? Is it worth our time? So what we're going to do is we're, um, we have a final chapter in our documents, uh, which we call the business case. And here, uh, what the analyst has done is he's calculated. It's a simple cost calculation that on average, field visits are much more expensive than if we have issues without field visits. And if we can even just reduce the number of field visits by one third, we can save over $200,000 per month. So it's definitely worthwhile. And finally, the only question remains, what actually needs to be done? What's the change that the analyst is suggesting to, to improve our process? 
And here, um, the answer is just adding a simple quality gate before we escalate to third level support. So again, we can link the target model here, and we can use our comparator to, to understand what's actually changed from the old model, which is here on the left-hand side, to the new model that's been suggested by the analyst. And in this case, the change is super simple. We've just got the extra step here. Right? But this makes it really under, easy to understand and reason about what, what's actually involved in process improvement. And then finally, what we'd expect is returning to the customer journey map sometime later, maybe some weeks later, for example, we'd expect obviously to have a positive effect from uh, the change that we've instigated, and we'd expect our high-level indicator to maybe change to orange to reflect that, uh, that we've impacted the process in a positive way. And that, in a nutshell, is how we think about combining all these different things, CJMs, BPMN models, and also process analysis to make process change happen. All right. So, any questions? So, you're representing an interaction via a website with the icon of a desk. I can imagine cases where you'd want to compare journeys where you're mm -hmm. actually at a desk or you're actually at a website. Mm -hmm. Do you want to take this one too? I mean, I can tell you as well. Um, basically, um, so we have some default shapes, of course, that you saw in the, in the editor there, right? These ones here on the left-hand side. Uh, but you can actually also upload your own shapes based uh, using your own images. So you're absolutely right. A lot of the time, it makes more sense and it's, it's more, more explanatory if you use the right image. And then you should be able to upload something digital as well. On you go. That's true. I was curious, though, what was the inspiration for what you did? Because there is a kind of uh, rigor to this. It's not immediately obvious, but it, it is there in terms of triggers and touch points. So what was the inspiration behind the album? What was the ins uh, inspiration behind what? The palette of choices for customer journey back. It's not like there's a standard. You mean for the shapes, right? Yeah, for the shapes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this is one of the current challenges we have. There is no standard, and all the clients I'm talking to that already did some customer journey mapping workshops, everyone has something different. And they say, your solution does not work for us. It looks entirely different. They have their own visual styling. So we already switched to the approach to enabling them to use their own imaginary, but like some key components here, for example, the touch point there we have some underlying logic, for example, touch points are um, very easy to connect to processes, right? And like you, you gain the bigger impact if when you're in the process, you don't see, hey, I'm connected to this customer journey. You wanna see what touch point you're actually connected to. Like this is what in the end creates the value. So like watching the market and testing a little bit with early customers, this is the initial set we came up with. Yeah. And this, uh, I, my gut reaction was, oh, maybe we should have a, a CG, CJML. <laughs> 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 Sorry, that's a good question. Um, yeah, it's a Yes. Hips or folded, <laughs> move. All these things are, are, are part of the understanding of the customer experience from a more emotional, heuristic, <laughs> uh, an emotional experience as opposed to a visceral or transactional. Yeah, I, I could go on for hours because we figured out after a while that even postures and emotions are different across various cultures. So. Um, expect some changes to come in the product, but um, we should exchange our thoughts at the wine tasting later on. <laughs> I need input. <laughs>
do you incorporate those mood <laughs> tracking kind of gives a priority to where you want to, well, first it match what your KPIs are, but then it also kind of prioritizes which step the KPIs are more important than another step. Mm. Do you incorporate that at all into your, your business? Or am I just talking about your roadmap? Uh, for that <laughs> And you you would do that according to how the emotional state is at that step I, in the journey. I, I suspect. I, I don't. I can't mm. quite put it out of black and white, but it feels like that's a guide to where to look at your journey and optimize it. Um, and I would also think that you could overlay other personas would also send you perhaps to other KPIs for the first steps of the journey. Have you thought about how to try to optimize your process over multiple journeys? Yeah, this is something we are currently experimenting with various ideas. But I already realized I need some product inspiration from you later on, <laughs> some good input. But like according to this um, empathy, emotional stuff, um, like this is something that also is heavily, like uh, in a lot of cases the journey maps come out of the marketing department or CX department and they focus on those steps, right? But we are more like a journey is something repeatable. This is something that makes, uh, puts it on the other side of the process. And this is not our main focus now. Like this emotional journey because this varies from persona to persona and this is very deep level. We are at the moment flying pretty high. So there was, yeah. yeah, Neil, please. I don't know if I had maybe one question or maybe a hundred, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but the, the top one has got me thinking, when I've been involved in customer journey mapping exercises, often ethnographic research is driving a lot of it, right? So it's, it's actually out there talking to people, running focus groups, figuring yes. out what, what's going well, what's not going well, comparing performance across channels, for example. So what happens when someone calls in to the call center versus sends an email? versus goes onto the website. Do you have any ambitions to try and play in that space at all, in terms of gathering data or enabling analysis on those kinds of data sets? But at the moment, this, is, this seems more like it's a kind of thinking tool, an abstract thinking tool for groups of people, rather than more of a data-driven thing. What's your ambition there? Where, where, do you know what I mean? Um. Like it's, I know what you mean, and like um, we we are not at a stage where we can replace that information gathering process and ideation in your company. You you still have to do that. Of course, you can also prototype with this tool, but it doesn't replace the initial work you have to do. Um, but we were also thinking about uh, some enhancements uh, in the product to leverage that. So, you, but I forgot the second part of your question. What was the second part? I know. I think that was yeah. That was, it was probably all one question. So thanks. That was good. Okay. All right. Looks like we have no further questions then. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot.